Nashville, Tennessee. It's the three. And here's your host, Laura Harris-Smith. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura Harris-Smith, and welcome to The Three. Hey, what does revival mean to you? It means something different to each of us. That's probably how it should be. But there's very little chance that you haven't heard the name Asbury uh, recently. If you're online or if you're watching television, Revival has broken out at Asbury University, and it's not the first time when Wilmore, Kentucky, that's where they are, and it has the nickname, Will You Give Us More, Lord, Kentucky, because a lot of, a lot of revivals happen there over the centuries, really. So one of the things we're going to do today is we're going to take you to Asbury. We've got interviews with students, faculty, and we're going to take you directly into one of the services. So let's start out. Here we are in Asbury. We're going to talk on today's episode about revival, different kinds of revival, the different eras of revival. It's so important. But as I said, we are here at Asbury, and just in case you are one of those people who has been under a rock, not watched the news, not been online, on social media, or been at church, let me just fill you in. Asbury University is a private Christian college. It's about 1,600 people, and you know, they say that a small college is under 5,000, big colleges being over 15,000. Well, 1,600 people evidently is a number that is just perfect for what happened here at this campus. And that is that in one of their chapel services, one student got up and I've not heard who he was. I've only heard it was a young man, but he got up and he confessed something in front of his peers. And he got down on his knees and about a hundred people got down with him on their knees. And as a result of that, that service never ended. It has been going on for two weeks here in Wilmore, Kentucky. Many revivals have happened here in Wilmore, Kentucky in the last hundred years or so. In fact, they've, they've earned the nickname, Will You Give Us More, Lord, Kentucky. But that service started two weeks ago and has continued here with 24-7 praise and worship. People have been coming from all over the world, Brazil, Europe, Asia, all over and it brought us from Nashville to make the drive down here my husband and I and my son Jude and we just wanted to 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 just give you a glimpse inside now let me just say this they have asked many people um, to not come inside with their cameras news reports have been done here from the lawn and news reports have been done from many different places but we do want to come to you from the campus and just tell you a little bit about what's going on here and get you expectant for revival. So let's just talk for just a minute about what revival even is. What do you define revival as? I'm really curious. And you can, you can write me at laura at the three dot TV and tell me what revival means to you. Now, when I was a, a young mother, actually, well, I'll just put it this way. When I was a young girl, <laughs> revival to me growing up as a young Baptist girl was something that we planned every year for about five days and so my first concept of revival was that you planned for it you showed up expectant and we had a special speaker that would come in and it would just be amazing it would be amazing because I expected it to be amazing and then when I was about 25 years old I had my third child and I remember there's even a picture of me and I am I just gave birth to him. I'm still in the hospital bed. I just gave birth to him. And I realized that he, Jason, was born during revival week and I was gonna miss revival. So <laughs> I remember looking at my calendar and my first thought was, oh no, I'm gonna miss revival. My second thought was, I got a son that was born during revival. And sure enough, he's a preacher. He's actually the associate pastor of Eastgate Creative Christian Fellowship, where we pastor near Nashville. He and his wife, Brittany, are our associate pastors. And he was actually due, Jason was due on the 100th birthday, anniversary of the birthday of my grandfather. His name was Mark Harris, and he was an itinerant preacher. And uh, lo and behold, Jason grew up to become a preacher too. 
so there's that picture I've shown it to you and he was born during revival and I just remember thinking oh no I'm what, what's gonna happen like am I gonna miss revival but isn't it wonderful how the Holy Spirit works well so then the next era of my life really can be defined as the Lord changing and shifting my thoughts on what revival was and it began to be something that happened spontaneously you lived looking for revival you lived expectant waiting for it and then when it happened it wasn't an it at all it was him it was the Holy Spirit coming for a visit and so that really defined really the last 25 35 years of my life uh, I'm nearing 60 now and you know that's really a, a interesting thing to think about how I, even I have redefined revival over the course of my life and my walk with the Lord but let's just look before we look at anything before we even go to see what scripture says about revival I want to look and see how the dictionary the dictionary itself is what defines revival the English dictionary because as we're standing out here right here outside of Hughes auditorium this is where the praise and worship is going on inside um, we are actually here during the last week of this everything is closing down tomorrow because they have midterms next week and so I've just loved how hearing how they've had to steward this with people everywhere but this is evidently the final day uh, of it as they are trying to return to a sense of normalcy for the sake of academia um, and these precious students who have governed so well what God has done and now they want to just see it go back out to the world through all the people that have come in. I want you to just take a look at this definition. The word revival is actually a noun and it means an improvement in the condition or strength of something, an instance of something becoming popular, active or important again, a new production of an old play or a similar work, a reawakening of religious fervor, especially by means of a series of evangelistic meetings. And then if you look at some of the words for revival that are in the thesaurus, you get words like improvement, rallying, uh, picking up, upswing. But what's really telling is when you look at the antonym. Okay, we just looked at all of the synonyms, but the antonym of revival, the word that means the opposite of revival, is disappearance. And so just with that in mind, just kind of filter everything that's going on here at Asbury through really through that lens and see how it's not that the Holy Spirit had begun to disappear here it's that look around you in the world the earth is experiencing I believe a disappearance of faith you are seeing people who they are not quite um, they're not invigorated they're not awakened and what revival does is it comes in and it just brings everything into focus that needs to be in focus meaning the Lord so there's a couple of different words in Scripture uh, that define revival and make up revival and the first one is actually a Greek word it's anapsixis it's Strong's G403 and it actually means revival but it's like to recover a breath uh, literally to revive your breath and then you've got another word that means revival in Hebrew and it is the word kaya and it means to live have life remain alive sustain life to live prosperously to live forever to be quickened be alive be restored to life or to health and again so that's the Hebrew word kaya it does mean revival uh, and it's also a word that's really special to mine and Chris's heart because at the church we pastor near Nashville Eastgate our daughter and son-in-law, Georgie and Donovan, they actually lead a group for young adults that's called Kaya. And it is with revival in mind. So we urge you, if you are in that young adult group, you need to get to Nashville. You need to come to Eastgate Creative Christian Fellowship. The address is on your screen. And then we'll also um, put the website up there. And you need to just come and experience that. Come to Kaya. If you're in that age group, this is like post high school, college age, and you know, on up to about 35. And we would love to see you there. So now that we have looked at what the Bible defines as revival in terms of what it means, um, what it does to one, to what it does to a generation, and then also what the dictionary thinks of it as, ask yourself again, what does revival mean to you? That's it. You've got to figure out what revival means to you. 
Well, when we come back from the break, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So stay close. Neuromatics Oil is a family of therapeutic grade patented oil blends created by nutritionist and author Laura Harris Smith. Invented for her own lifelong journey for neurological health, Quiet Brain now helps those worldwide who suffer from insomnia, migraines, anxiety, seizures, tremors, and more. Quiet Brain contains oils like frankincense, myrrh, lavender, sandalwood, and others. Next, Happy Brain is a bright mood lifting citrus blend and contains oils like lemon, lime, clementine, spearmint, and more. Users say it combats depression and even aids in weight loss. Next is Sharp Brain, Laura's Focus Blend, also used to improve cognitive memory issues with oils like coffee, cinnamon, vanilla, clove, and others. Each $69.95 bottle is a 10-week supply if used daily, or about a dollar a day. And right now, buy two bottles and get the third one free, and get a free eye mask using the promo code on your screen at neuromaticsoil.com or at 1-855-784-3827. That's 1-855-QUIETBRAIN. Hi everybody, I'm Laura, you're watching The Three. We're answering the question today, what does revival mean to you? Do you know how many revivals there have been? You ever thought about this? <laughs> well, there's been more than you can count because from the dawn of creation, since there's been man, just about, there's been sin. And ever since there's been sin, there's been a reason to get back to God and to revive ourselves. So let's take a look at some of the biblical revivals. You may not think about revivals happening in the Bible, but they did. There's even revivals in the Old Testament. You see it back as far as 3000 BC. Uh, it says in Genesis 4, already in Genesis 4, we need reviving. It says at that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. And then jumping forward, you see more revivals in Genesis uh, with Jacob. In Exodus, look at all the judges there. Um, the different judges in, well, the book of Judges, who we see revivals occur under. Then we jump into 1 Samuel, look at King David. We're in 2 Chronicles now, 1 Kings. Um, all of these people, you see that God used them to bring about a reviving of his people's faith. It happened with Jonah and Nineveh or Hezekiah, uh, Josiah. Wow, that was an important one because little King Josiah at the age of eight actually knocked down the Asherah poles. He didn't just take down the idols like some of the other good kings did. He took down the high places to where the idols could not even be resurrected and, and put back up there. And then the last revival of the Old Testament we see happening under Ezra and Nehemiah. But what about the New Testament? Now, Jesus is coming on the scene, but when did we start needing revivals? <laughs> well, the first one was the revival under John the Baptist. You see that in the Gospels. Then, of course, the ministry of Jesus itself. Uh, go to the book of Acts and you're going to find Pentecost. You're going to find revival in Samaria. The revival was coming then through the disciples. You see it happening with Peter uh, there. Uh, look at, keep going all the way down. Look at all of these in the book of Acts, all the way up to 62 AD when Paul was shipwrecked on the island of Malta. Now think about it. We often think that revivals have to be planned and orchestrated, but so many of the ones you just saw happened organically and entirely by the hand of God. I'm sure that Paul didn't expect for revival to break out when he got to Malta. I don't know. Maybe he did. Uh, but the fact is, is that it did because there were people there where there's people, there's sin, remember? And where there's sin, there's a need to be revived and restored, awakened to God. All right, so now we keep going. Keep going from that biblical era all the way up to the 1700s. Let's go through that and just look at that for just a moment. Because in there, you're going to find some things you may not have heard of. Okay, starting in Lyons, we see all these revivals from 175 AD all the way up. Let's come all the way down here to 601 AD, Gregory the Great. Now, he was a bishop of Rome and, you know, he found it necessary to write to Augustine of Canterbury and exhort him to not be puffed up with pride. Um, it was a good indication that revival had taken place during the course of his ministry. And in his confessions, he called him, he claimed a special dispensation of the spirit, which enabled him to convert the heathen um, and to do signs and wonders. Okay, we keep going all the way down through the 10th century, down through 
St. Francis of Assisi in 1208. And now look at this, look at these reform movements. The seventh century, the 11th century, the 14th century, on and on and on. Come all the way down here until you get to 1494 and you're gonna see Florence, Italy. Now this was a special um, revival. It appeared that there were prophetic gifts outpoured and this really led the way for 1525 when you see William Tyndale hit the scene. He was an English reformer and he published uh, it was incomplete, but he published a translation of the Bible into English in 1525. And then the first complete edition of the New Testament was completed by Tyndale in 1526. You see the Protestant Reformation beginning under Martin Luther, the Swiss Reformation, the Anabaptists hit the scene in Germany, on and on, look at this, on down to John Calvin. He was a French Protestant who had spent the previous decade in exile writing his Institutes of the Christian Religion. And he was invited to settle in Geneva and he put his reform doctrine into practice. You go on through the late 16th and 17th centuries, so much happening with the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, uh, on into Edinburgh and Inverness, awakening, sweeping through England, through Scotland, through Ireland, and then in 1665 in London, at the time of the Great Plague, there was actually an awakening in the city. Puritan ministers, um, they'd been ejected from their pulpits in the mid 1600s. And then boom, you see it in 1680, there are revivals breaking out in Massachusetts, Plymouth and Connecticut. All right, let's stop there. And next week, we're gonna take a look at all the great awakenings. Do you know how many of those there are? <laughs> well, we'll take a look at that then. Be right back after the break. Neuromatics Oil is a family of therapeutic grade patented oil blends created by nutritionist and author Laura Harris Smith. Invented for her own lifelong journey for neurological health, Quiet Brain now helps those worldwide who suffer from insomnia, migraines, anxiety, seizures, tremors, and more. Quiet Brain contains oils like frankincense, myrrh, lavender, sandalwood, and others. Next, Happy Brain is a bright mood-lifting citrus blend and contains oils like lemon, lime, clementine, spearmint, and more. Users say it combats depression and even aids in weight loss. Next is Sharp Brain, Laura's focus blend, also used to improve cognitive memory issues with oils like coffee, cinnamon, vanilla, clove, and others. Each $69.95 bottle is a 10-week supply if used daily, or about a dollar a day. And right now, buy two bottles and get the third one free and get a free eye mask using the promo code on your screen at neuromaticsoil.com or at 1-855-784-3827. That's 1-855-QUIETBRAIN. I'm naturopathic Dr. Laura Harris-Smith, and if you'll give me 10 days, Give It to God and Go to Bed can help you stress less, sleep better, and dream more. There are even links inside to my free 10 Days to Deeper Sleep and Dreams program and 10 Good Night videos. Can you close your eyes and just still listen to me? The whole book takes place in your bedroom, and with chapter titles like The Junk Under Your Bed, The Treasures in Your Bedroom, and The Monsters in Your Closet, Give It to God and Go to Bed helps you learn to rest and hear God speak in dreams. Take back your sleep and dreams, my friend, with Give It to God and Go to Bed. Hi everybody, welcome back to The Three. I'm Laura Harris-Smith, and we're gonna go right back out to Wilmore, Kentucky, uh, where we really heard more from, oh my goodness, we got to interview staff there um, and students, and I want you to listen to an interview that I did with one of the staff members there. She's their communications director. Take a listen. I'm here with Abby Lobb. Abby, what do you do? Thank you for letting us in. What do you do at Asbury? I am the communications director here at Asbury. Okay, so you said Fox has been here, CNN has Who all's been here? Just about every major <laughs> news outlet you could think of has okay. been here or is coming here. <laughs> so then I remember on the very first night, I remember we were watching, I think it was Tucker Carlson, and he said he was set to come. Mm -hmm and received a call from some of the students saying, hey, we love your show and all, mm -hmm. but don't come just yet. Yeah. So when did that shift or did you just, you had to just throw the doors open and go, okay, fine, come see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so he was he was sweet. He reached out and you know, he loved what he was seeing here. You know, of course he reports on a lot of bad news because yes. <laughs> that's the world. Mm -hmm. And he found out about this story and was just blown away by how 
good it was. Mm -hmm. And he was dying to talk about it. And we were like, yes, please, like, talk about Jesus on TV. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he's like, well, what if I come and do my show here? And we just, you know, from the very beginning, whether it was a show like that or whether it was, you know, celebrity you know, pastors or musicians mm -hmm. or whoever it may be, um, our leadership made the wise decision from the beginning. Like, no, this is not about that. It's just not about that. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not saying like, oh, we're so great, but we didn't need that. God was working. <laughs> You know, yeah. God was doing this. He's like, no, I got this. Just yeah. let me work. So. And I think even he's he's made to feel welcome in mm -hmm. the humility because it's not about any of you. Mm -hmm. It's not about anybody that comes in and even brings a camera and tries to, you know, I know my motives are pure. Yeah. I want this to perpetuate itself in the world. Yes. I want everybody watching right now, whether they're on their phone or at their mm -hmm. kitchen table or in their living room or wherever they are, to say revival starts with me. Yeah. It begins with me. Mm -hmm. So then what I'm most impressed with, your president, his name is? Dr. Kevin Brown. Brown, Dr. Brown. I heard that when this student um, did what he did in chapel, it just began with real, real repentance and confession. The students wanted to linger. Mm -hmm. That he sent a pretty gutsy email, especially with the... Um, Especially with midterms coming up in like yeah. a couple of weeks, knowing with the history of revival yeah. that this campus has, yeah. what was going to happen? What did Dr. Brown do? Yeah, so you know, chapel gets out at eleven o'clock, ten fifty to be exact. And typical of college students, they kind of run into chapel and then they run out of chapel, <laughs> and it's just kind of part of their day. But I love that we have that rhythm built in in their life. Like that's so important to establish at an early mm -hmm. age. Mm -hmm. um, and so <laughs> we were all really shocked that they were still in there. We're like, no, you can't. No. <laughs> and so I kept getting text messages, like first from my VP and then from a few other people just that I work with. They're like, oh, my gosh, if you're on campus, just like peek in the back of chapel. I was like, man, I, w I was working from home that day. I was like, darn. <laughs> I wish I was there. I know. And so I just kept hearing about it throughout the day and just little like, hey, just 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 go look. And it was all students. So we didn't want to just like go in there and be like, hey, like it was clear something was moving in the students mm -hmm. and so and just worship kept playing and you know the, the gospel choir was singing that day in chapel and um the one of our campus pastor people who speaks a lot he he was talking about love in action talked about things like repentance i mean it just like the holy spirit just lit that flame during that chapel and so around 1 30 i think is when dr brown sent that email and it was two sentences i'll never forget it was like there's worship happening in hughes i encourage you to go join if you'd like that was it <laughs> and the students started coming yeah and and i think they had heard about that before then they were all texting each other uh -huh, yeah. and like <laughs> like running back to hughes like I can't tell you how, you know how students are, like, oh, chapel, it's like, you know. That's what my husband and I were talking. We both went to a Christian university. Yes. We have six children that we raised. The last one just graduated college. He said, it's a miracle they wanted to go to chapel. I know that there is a culture here that is very, um, very receptive to the Lord. But sometimes, even with church, yeah. Christians can get in this habit of checking it off their That's list the way you check off chapel. Mm -hmm. And this day's chapel couldn't be checked off. That's exactly right. God was like, no, not quite. And then um, so I just kept hearing about how it was growing. And, you know, at that point still, it was just limited to our student body. It was really just, you know, students here at Asbury. So I was like, okay, I have to go into work early on Thursday and see what this is about. And I'm like, I hope it's still going on. So sure enough, I got in at like 730 that morning and walked in there and it's really quiet. There was a girl just on the piano. There were groups kind of huddled together praying. It was obvious a couple of the kids had spent the night in there. <laughs> Oh, wow. I saw blankets. I even saw a kid laying on this like little mattress thing, like like a camping kind of mattress. I was like, this can't be yeah. happening. Yeah. And it, and when I walked in there, I was overwhelmed with a sense of peace. I mean, it was overwhelming. Because, you know, we're all busy. Like, everybody's busy. And I just walked in there and went, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> and then throughout the day, people just kept coming in. Again, students again. And I heard they were like skipping classes and our students are high, high achievers and, you know, they, they, they do a good job. They don't skip class, you know, and so it just kept growing from there. And then by the weekend, it was like, you know, alumni who were local, people started driving from places. It was the Wilmore community. And then it just like exploded. Oh. <laughs> it was and crazy. Then people from all over the world are coming. I love it. Did you know that 
there are nine revivals that have happened at Asbury. Take a look at this timeline because you can just go to their website and see it. In February 1905, a blizzard breaks out in the men's dormitory <laughs> and prayer just spilled onto the campus and then to the whole town of Wilmore. February 1908, February 1921, on the last day of school at Asbury, 1950, uh, also February, you see in the theme here, March 1958, 1970, uh, February of that year, 1992, February 2006. And then, of course, that brings us up to present 2023. The whole revival started with the confession of one young man. And I'm heard, I'm told there were 19 people there, 19 people present. Um, I have seen some of those who were present, precious young men and women of God. And this one girl said that she just felt like she was about to leave, had her backpack on, and she just felt like she was supposed to slip it off and put it on the pew and come back in. That's where revival starts, where we are willing to be interrupted, where we're willing to let the Holy Spirit have his way. And then that kicked it off. And when we were there two weeks later, this is just a little bit about uh, of what we were experiencing that night. Take a listen. only media there that night it felt like a real privilege just a real privilege to go in there and we had I mean we came out and other major news networks were pushed back far beyond the steps like into one of the parking lots and there we were we just came out the three just came out with our cameras and um, our audio gear and got some incredible interviews so I invite you back next time we're gonna hear more from the students and the faculty, staff, and even more from the Lord <laughs> at Asbury University. But we even got testimonies of people there who just very dramatic things happened to. All right, we will see you next time on The Three. I'm Laura Harris-Smith. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>